Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming. And uh, as an introductory to Zen, I would like to um, appreciate all the 2,560 years since the Buddha's birth. I believe that all these traditions appear out of a source that we do not know but we can experience. We cannot really say what the Buddha attained. It's termed enlightenment awakening. There are many words to describe that. But in fact, what he attained can only be experienced but not adequately described. I believe the same applies to other great teachers of spirituality. So if I want to put that into context, then the Buddha's enlightenment, Jesus' appearance, Lao Tzu as his teaching appeared in the Tao Te Ching, was like a spiritual big bang, a huge explosion of enlightened energy that started to expand in our world. And as Time went on and on. This very hot and very bright substance started to cool down and it became the galaxies of interests, territories, politics, etc., etc. So then spirituality cooled into something uh, you could see in books, you can see in rituals, you can read in prayers. And if we still have a chance to get back to the original temperature, to the original intensity of the founders, then that is spiritual practice. That we actually do something to get back to that point of the original mind, the original light, the original intensity of that teaching, so that we could become one with that. If not, we can just become a little satellite of a planet, of a little solar system, of another galaxy, a huge cluster of galaxies, which is also okay, but in our minds we should somehow get to the substance of all. And that substance has no name, no form, no life, no death, no coming, no going. Zen and Buddhism uh, is not starting with an instant recipe for happiness. Rather than that, it offers insight into who we think we are versus what we truly are. And we can clearly attain something meaningful, something clear, and when we get rid of our illusions, our mind's energy becomes clear and strong. When that happens, we can eliminate the suffering which we ourselves create for each other. So, where is the original energy of this spiritual Big Bang? It's right at this moment. When you hear this sound, for a moment there is no thinking. That moment was clarity, insight, and the source of wisdom and compassion. At this moment, you can see how the mind creates past, present, and future. And only by coming back to this moment can you see how your karma is appearing, sustained, and disappearing. These processes are so important that in the old Hindu religion, they put three gods next to them. Brahma was the creator, Vishnu is the sustainer, and Shiva is the what I call the recycler. There is no more destruction. It's recycled, okay? So we can observe these in our minds. Zen means literally becoming one, becoming clear, attaining the truth, attaining our substance. It comes from the Sanskrit word jhana, then in Chinese channa, then chan, in Korean son, and Japanese zen. The word means actually practicing, not just understanding. If we read the user's manual, fine, but if we don't use the equipment, then we don't get the function of that equipment and everything just remains an idea. This is the reason that in the old days there was not so much talking. When you see the Buddha's teaching written down in huge volumes, 
traditionally 84,000 tablets in many, many printed volumes. That was a work of 49 years of teaching, collected and cleaned up. So, if you add all that, then 84,000 scriptures is not that many. If you read the sutras, the Buddha always talks about the same thing. From various angles, through various stories, he always talks about enlightenment and saving all beings from suffering. He wanted to start with one important truth, which is in the Flower Garland or Avatamsaka Sutra in Korean Hwaum Kyong. And if you want to understand the nature of this world, then perceive it as created by mind alone. That's the job. But when he started to teach, most of his former friends, now students, and onlookers, inquirers, they did not understand. It was just one step between 0% and 100. So he took one step back and started with something that people could understand. And that was the content of the Lotus Sutra, which was the Four Noble Truths, the fact of suffering, the cause of suffering, the end of suffering, and the way to end suffering. These Four Noble Truths, they give insight into the nature of karma, how it works, how we operate as human beings. If we suffer, why we suffer, if there is an end to it, how we can get there. And the practice that he taught went to many cultures, went to countries where we say now there is Theravada Buddhism. It also went to countries where we now say there is Mahayana Buddhism. But it took about three to four hundred years after the Buddha's time for these distinct schools to appear. Korean Zen is part of the Northern Transmission, part of Mahayana Buddhism. It incorporated everything that it found, did not reject anything, but it taught the transcendental wisdom, which in the Buddha's time came about 15, 20 years into his teaching time. And we call them the Prajnaparamita or Transcendental Wisdom Scriptures, the Heart Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, many sutras that are only teaching how to transcend yourself, how to transcend any kind of duality, how not to identify with the phenomena, and how to see yourself in your right place as a human being, what we are doing on this planet. So for that, this moment is the key. Many of us, we have a big notion of the past, and a lot of worries about the future. So, when this moment is very small, then we are very uncertain. And this uncertainty and insecurity makes us do terrible things. So if we are not lost in the past, and if we don't worry about the future too much, then the notion of this moment can become very solid. We call that presence. So by meditating correctly, you are being present at this moment. Now, this kind of presence is everything. If you have the moment, you can do anything. If you lose this moment, you lose everything. So, I always encourage practitioners and those who are interested in Zen to keep it simple, keep it clear, come back to this moment always, all the time, in any circumstances. And then, the notion of the past and the notion of the future, they get integrated into this moment as your own creation. Okay? So, in Korean Zen, there's something unique, the tradition of kongans, or teaching stories. This is originating from Huineng, the sixth patriarch of Chinese Buddhism who was altogether 34 generations after Shakyamuni Buddha. And uh, in Korean, he was known as Yuk Cho De Sa, the sixth patriarch. And uh, he asked this question in a very important moment. When you don't think of good and bad, what is your original face? What is your true substance? What is your true nature? 
So this simple one-liner opened up huge treasures that we understand now as Tang Dynasty China, Zen Masters, Kongan teaching. So if you look into Zen Master Chao Cho or Joju, he was teaching for about 60 years and he has a whole book of Kongans. Other Zen Masters like Nan Chuan or Nam Chon or Lin Chi, Rinzai in Chinese, sorry, Lin Chi, Rinzai in Japanese, Imje in Korean, uh, he also left a very important heritage behind. In Kongan practice, you deal with your own opposites, your own paradoxes, in a very unique way. Especially in the West, we want to decide things for the good and we want to suppress the bad. And we want to be right, we don't want to be wrong. We have unresolved uh, problems and we will always want to solve them and eliminate the unresolved problems. Now, many centuries ago in Asia, they recognized that this is impossible. You can do this to a certain extent, but never 100%. Contrary to logic, we would have to look at our entire consciousness to attain what is beyond our consciousness. So look at your paradoxes in their entirety. Don't deny any part of it, but also don't follow any part of it. Don't attach to it, but also don't hide your eyes and don't try to cover your insight into it. So looking at Kongans means looking at your paradoxes, looking at your unresolved mysteries inside, and take them as already complete. Already complete only appears when your mind becomes clear. If your mind is dualistic, then your notion of good and bad, right and wrong, always cuts off some part. It's like blind people going into the zoo. And they all want to say what the elephant is. But they can only touch one part. Some touches the legs, some the trunk, some the hose, etc., some the ear. And they all say their own notion that it's like a pillar, it's like a hose, it's like a, a big flat piece of a canvas. But these blind men, they only see part of it, and it wouldn't be incorrect if they knew that they only see part of it. And everybody believes that we have it all. We have everything. We know it perfectly. And when we do that, we lose what we don't know. We lose what we don't see or don't want to see. So this is why when you have paradoxical thinking and when you have opposites inside, Zen teaches you not to suppress it, but perceive it and ask, where does this come from? What is this really? And then, when your mind does not make good and bad, when you perceive your original face, then you can give correct answers, correct solutions to questions which defy logic, where there seems no good solution, but there is one, you just have to give up the notion of good and bad, and then it works. i give you an example. Zen Master Joju visited two hermits, and he asked the first, did you get it? That is, did you get enlightenment? The hermit showed his big fist. Joju says, the water is too shallow for me to anchor here. And he moves on. Then he asked the other hermit, did you get it? That hermit also showed his big fist. Joju bows to him and says, you are truly free from life and death. I deeply respect you. So the question is, why did Joju approve of one but not the other? Now, if you look at your own reaction, your own mind, it tends to go in circles. It was the same, so why did he make a difference? Was he wrong? Was he really Zen master? Were the hermits different? Did they have the same fist? They, they had different fists. So all these dualistic questions, they show your mental habits. So Kongans are like an x-ray machine. They really show you how you think, how you react. There are even stronger ones, like, again, Zen Master Joju. Uh, he received a monk, and the monk said, 
well, when I came to your monastery, I met an old woman, and I asked her, how do I get to Taesan? And this woman said to me, only go straight. So I went straight ahead, but after I took a few steps, she said, you're a good monk, but you must go this way. And she pointed to another direction. So Juju says, wow, that's very strange. Let me check her out. So he goes down to the roadside, dressed as a plain monk, and he asked the old woman, how do I get to Taesan? The old woman said exactly the same thing, ending with, you're a good monk, but you must go this way. So Joju returns to the monastery and says to the monks, I completely understood the old woman from Taesan. There are several questions about this. One, why did the old woman test the monk? When Joju tested the old woman, did he have a mind or not? Or how would you get to Taesan? These questions, again, they stop you in your grooves. They don't let you think any further because they are designed to elevate your consciousness beyond thinking. So Kongans are the realm where thinking starts to hurt, where it becomes improductive, where it becomes seemingly fruitless and useless, although you can use your thinking and you should use your thinking very well in everyday life. So Kongans are the gateways to transcendental wisdom. And that's why in Zen it is said, if you want to pass through this gate, do not give rise to thinking. That's why Zen meditation is an open-eyed, clear, being present type of meditation. When you do not have any intentional thinking, you put your focus into your Tantian, therefore into your no thinking center, and you keep your mind there as much as you can. It's a long process because we have thinking habits, feeling habits, making past, present, and future, other kinds of projection habits. And because of that, it's not easy to stay here. But when you do, after a while, clarity comes. So I believe this is enough for introductory, and uh, I would very much like to hear your questions. Thinking about dimensions uh, a lot lately, about fourth, fifth, and so forth. How, it, uh, how the universe is constructed, and how space-time and things works. Have you any experience in that? Uh, what I have an experience of is what it means to be in this human body. And uh, it is really peculiar that we put so much energy into exploring the three plus one dimensions of space and time. Uh, but we have very little experience of exploring the very instrument which does the research. So if we meditate correctly and we become independent of all phenomena and we do not identify with anything we see, hear, taste, smell, touch, think, feel, etc. Then we can perceive that we have this universal experience as it is because we are in this human body. So why we have three dimensions of space and one dimension of time, put it in the old way. Because we are in this human body with this human mind and with these instruments of sensation, etc., etc. It is possible to become independent of these. It is possible to get transcendental experience. But for that, you have to stop thinking. As long as you think, you are trapped in this space-time experience. And whatever mathematics you have in your mind, it's an expansion of it. Okay? So instead of so much cognition, I suggest we expand our observation. Expand the power of observation, not just through, not just through various telescopes, but the insight into human consciousness. Why we operate in the way we do? Why we have dualistic mind? Why we have a body which is born, lives 60, 70, 80 years mostly, and then goes away? So what kind of instrument do we have to perceive this world? Because this instrument determines the result of the experiment. This is our limitation, but this is our potential as well. So 
seeing the relativity of our experience is already a great gift. Because whether you go to science or religion, most people want their views to be taken as absolute. Now this is the only one which is right and everything else is wrong or less right, less sigma value than mine. So going for that certainty is natural, but it's also natural never to attain it. When we seem to attain the absolute, when we have the ultimate experience in the form of a phenomenon, then we are on the wrong path and face destruction very clearly and very imminently. In the realm of phenomena, there is no absolute. Everything is dependent on causes and conditions, and we have the three powers of impermanence, interdependence and imperfection built into this. You can't take it out. So I don't care how many dimensions people experience, but do we perceive what it is that experiences it? So it doesn't matter what kind of karma you have. Some people say I have good karma. Some people say I have bad karma. Some people suffer. Some people are happy. From a Zen point of view, it makes no difference. What does make a difference, do you attain what you truly are? That's the difference. And if you do, you can change your karma. You can go to extra dimensions. You can have extra experience just because your sensor became so clear. So that kind of clarity is uh, the focus in Zen. And uh, external experiences, as they appear, stay and disappear, they are not really our concern. Why? That's not what we are looking for. Anything ephemeral, anything impermanent, anything interdependent, imperfect, that's not what you truly are. There is something that doesn't come, doesn't go, uses your eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body and mind, that has no name and no form. And you can attain that like all of us can attain that. Without that, we wouldn't be even human. Without that, we wouldn't be able to say I, okay? But we constantly confuse this I with something else than what we truly are. We call that ego or self-image. I'd rather use self-image because ego has a bad vibration to it as if it was inherently evil. No, you need a notion of ego, but you also need to know how it works, how it came to being, and how you can make it disappear, how you can turn it off, okay, and then back on. So the notion of self gives you the self-image. And the self-image usually has a shorter or longer distance, in inverted commas, between your true self. So your true self and your self-image, in most cases of humans, they are different. And the bigger the distance, the bigger the suffering. The closer they are, the more harmonious life is because you are one with the flow, you are one with the universe, you understand how things work, you are perceiving cause and effect. These are just paraphrases of closeness or proximity of self-image and true nature or true self. So if your illusions are not so strong, your suffering is also not so strong. And when you totally take away self-image and only your true nature or our true nature remains, then no suffering. Now, that's what I would focus on because that's the key to everything. So how would it be possible that a heavily deluded mind would ever get to the truth? No, they are just wasting money on, on instruments. So if the mind is clear, the research is clear, the results are also clear. So that's why we have to work on the sensor, on our clear like space, clear like mirror consciousness, if we want to go beyond our current boundaries as we are, as we think we are. But it's not the way we truly are. It's just a bunch of habits. All these limitations, whether it's dimensional, temporal, sensory, whatever we call it, the wall of our habits, attachments, illusions, and self-image, that's the only barrier. And if you want to go beyond that, nothing external will help. Internal, that helps. Mind practice, that helps. 
and then we can really progress. If you look at humanity, small group, big group, anywhere, we have been walking in circles. Circles and circles, smaller, bigger, short radius, long radius, in the last 5,000 years, which is probably as much as we can credibly see back in the past as human race. It's disappointing, as if we never learned. And the reason is that we could never go beyond our own self-image, our own notion as humans and world. If we did that, we would change. And this is a change which is, I believe, totally imminent, because if we don't do that, we would inflict so much damage on ourselves and this planet in the next couple of decades that we will be way worse than anything that we have done before. And I'm not talking about any apocalyptic notions. This is not that kind of genre or school where we entertain such notions. Anyway, an apocalypse would be just too easy to get away with. It's not going to happen. We have to work our way out. Yeah, um, a big riddle for everyone to think about their life and uh, how to get free from suffering. It is true, it's a riddle, but it's a riddle not to think about, but actually work with and perceive. Other questions? I have uh, not good my focus. First of all, we have three important channels, body, energy, and mind. And when you have all of them in the moment, then your focus will increase. So perceive your body as it sits, perceive your breath as it pulsates, and perceive your mind as it has all this monkey style movement, not just you, all of us. So when you put this into uh, a mantra circle, a cycle which actually limits this energy and focuses this energy, then you can stay in the moment with total function. So integrate body, energy, and mind into this moment by perception and the tools that aid that perception. In this case, mantra seems to be the best. Short mantra, not so long, it's enough. And uh, if people have different mindset, they can use a question, a great question. And that focus and integration will be theirs. More questions? I was thinking about this uncertainty of living, of life. Um, I, um, my question is, um, when you meditate, uh, you, you pass um, things in your life uh, where you uh, come to this point of uncertainty. Um, Did you pass that? I don't know if I have passed it. Because if you did, please sit into this chair no. and co continue. <laughs> so. No, no, <laughs> I, I don't think I have passed it, but I, um, mm. uh, I have explored it. And um, um, I, I wanted to ask if that's the suffering. No, uncertainty is not suffering. Sometimes being very, very certain is suffering itself because you can't get out of it. It's a box which is sealed tight and shut, that's it. When we look for challenge, when we look for risk, when we look for new things, when we are just curious, we want to get out of this certain destined feeling. So when you have a path, you can make choices. You never see the end, you can see your direction. But only when you get there, that's when you see the result, not before. Certainty many times feels like destiny because it doesn't involve anything creative, anything new, anything real as your choice. It's already sealed. Everything is certain. It turns out that neither in our mind nor in our material world do we have absolute certainty. So not far from here geographically, the uncertainty principle was born in the last century before the Second World War Heisenberg was great. He was, he was a fantastic scientist. The uncertainty principle, I believe, is just as important as general and special relativity. Okay? If we didn't have that, we would not have the right notion, even in this partial understanding of the material universe as we have. And this understanding is expanding as we speak, not just because they are always finding heavier or lighter particles 
in the big collider or in something smaller detector, lighter detector, whether it's a big bang or a small bang, whether you can only hear it or you can also see it. But we keep expanding this material experience and it's less and less certain as a complete picture, but more and more detailed as a relative set of data. And that's the marvel about it. So we can say the more we know, the less certain we are. Okay? And this is awesome. Okay? It teaches you to be humble. So nobody, nobody in Einstein's time or before would have thought that a goodish 95-96% of the universe is not visible because it doesn't react with photons. So when we talk about dark matter and dark energy, comprise the two together, it's 95-96% of the entire universe. And what you can observe as galaxies and dust and gas and whatnot, it's four, maximum five. What is really interesting that our personality, in terms of subconscious and conscious, they relate pretty much the same way. Psychologists say, you know your whole being five, maximum 10%. I think 10% is a very generous. And the rest is subconscious. So that part of the universe is really subconscious. That part of our self, as we seem to know it, but we don't, is also big time subconscious. When we meditate in, the, in Zen, we stop uh, conscious thinking. Sooner or later, you know how to do that, how to let this urge out to always make things up with your conceptual thinking. So if you take the first five physical senses as the first five channels, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body as touch, then the sixth consciousness is your CPU, it's your conceptual thinking. The seventh is your controller, the discrimination faculty. That's where you make I and the rest, right and wrong, good and bad, want, not want. The eighth is your hard drive, is your storehouse. Now, if you look at it this way, then the body and the soul, they have a very clear connection through the senses and all these mental faculties. And that's what makes us a sentient being. When we meditate, then the sixth and the seventh will start to subside, will kind of calm down. And then, as a byproduct in Zen meditation, lots of data from the eighth, they hit your awareness, they hit your screen, your sensor. It's like a super telescope just going totally sharp. And then you see into the past of the universe. And it's your personal past too. You can perceive several things that are in your subconscious. I don't want to make a whole list because then people would feel obligated to see that during their meditation. But what comes came from your storehouse. And Zen means we do not attach to it because your storehouse consciousness is not your true self. It's just your memory. It's there, you can have a very clear relationship to that, but it's not your true self. So the body is the hardware, the soul is the software. The eight levels of consciousness mean a combination of these two, but in Zen we are looking for the operator. The operator who operates hardware and software together. Now that's a big task, that's for sure, okay? So in the meantime, when you meditate, you can have uh, lots of memories appearing and touching your mirror, your clear mind. But that's just a byproduct. The precondition for that to appear, that you stop the sixth and the seventh consciousness to a reasonable extent. Otherwise, you would make it up, and many people make it up out of their good heart, because they want to have good meditation, so they make the experience instead of letting the experience reach them. It's a big difference, okay? But none of them is the object of the search here in this genre. Remember what we talked about in terms of the moment? When this moment is clear, your mind is clear, then you can perceive your situation, relationship, and function very clearly. Now, that active, creative, and dynamic approach, that's Zen. We are not dependent on any part of the eight consciousnesses, but we use all the eight. If you want to help, 
attain this moment, attain this clear mind. And then moment to moment, what you have around you gives you your task. It's good. I know your job. You're doing a very important job for the elderly and the sick. So that gives you the chance to help all beings. You cannot address all of them. There's too many for one. And uh, if you practice and keep your mind clear and you do your job and you care for your relationships, you have already helped all those beings that are dependent on you. And that's perfectly enough. Even that is bigger than we usually can do. Okay? So aspiration should not be an obsession, never. Because then we go into various extremes just to mobilize the energy to reach that unreachable goal. So situation, relationship, and function. If that's clear, you can progress on the bodhisattva path. The bodhisattva path means moment to moment wake up and moment to moment save all beings from suffering just within reach. And that's enough. Anything in terms of desire or anger will decrease your chance to actually help because it produces those waves and distortions in the mind that would prevent you from seeing cause and effect. Seeing cause and effect is way deeper, way more radical, and way more intense than labeling people as good or bad. So instead of thinking in terms of good and bad, think in terms of cause and effect. Where does that go? And you see that if somebody raises a sword, dies by that sword. So ultimately karma comes to full circle and you see how it works. Now, our job is to realize what kind of cycles we are part of. If you keep your mind beyond dualities, then mantra practice will alleviate that pain, which is compassion not manifesting in that moment. It's all painful. And it's coming from a genuinely human sentiment that we want to eliminate suffering. And that moment, which you saw on the screen, it was not possible. So first of all, you can define your relationship by chanting a mantra of compassion there and be compassionate in the world that you reach. Very important, both of them. If you're angry, you become part of the anger cycle. If you're angry at that, you already shot the bullet and somebody already shot back at you. An important standpoint is to perceive how you relate to all these. And if you relate with anger, then you're part of it from the same destructive end as those people that you're angry at. So if you become totally livid and extremist in your mind, then what's the difference? The clothing, the weapons. So in that sense, we really have to transcend our dualistic feelings and thinking before we can apply any help, any meaningful help. Why? In this case, help is defined as a solution that does not recreate the problem. And if you look at humanity as we have done things so far, in some cases we could eliminate the problems, and in some cases we reproduce the problems big time. Now for that, to distinguish what kind of solution brings what kind of durability, we have to have some wisdom and compassion. And for that, you cannot have the aspiration to solve all the problems single-handed, only you, in the world. It's a deity complex. Having compassion towards everybody, very human. Wanting to solve all the problems, all by yourself, all on your terms, that's a kind of distortion. If we saw cause and effect, if we saw how our, our mind works, we would not commit those faults that will make us or others evil. So evil and good, they are relative categories. And these categories arise depending on what we think we are and what we think the other person is. So you talked about the right to be faulty. Some people took this right to the very extreme of exterminating other humans without a single twinge of conscience. We call that evil. They call it their own right to expand and have some uh, living space, okay? So the relativity of these views, as painful as it is, is our greatest teacher that originally good and evil do not exist. We make them. And as we make them, they are relative from where you look at it. And this is not being immoral or unethical. 
it's a call for actually perceiving cause and effect that you cannot mitigate a murder. A murder is a murder. There is no label that can make it better or worse, but it's murder. So that causes suffering. That's why we don't do it. But if we operate with good and evil, then there is righteous skill, then there is war, then there is this kind of act, that kind of act, and you can explain it away. But if you look at it in terms of clear cause and effect, then there is no way to mitigate that. It's very clear that if you separate forcefully a body and a mind, it causes a huge painful rupture in the entire relationship of that person relative to father, mother, whole family, society, plus the karma that the person didn't finish. Now what you heard is a simple cause and effect relationship. I didn't talk about religion, morality, social ethics and whatnot, because they can be turned upside down and inside out in a matter of years or decades, and then back again. If you see how political views and social views and norms and religions have changed just in Europe in the last 100 years, it's terrible, as if we never had a single backbone of behaving correctly. Just in the last 100 years, more than 100 million people died in Europe precisely because we couldn't decide what to look at, what is good, what is bad, what is cause and effect, and what is projection. And all these ideologies were the basis of killing large numbers of people. And most fortunately, Sweden was just remotely looking at it, but the central, the southern, the eastern, and the western part of Europe, we were knee deep in it. We were covered. So that's why. Do not label it as good and evil. See the cause and effect relationship and decide whether we want it or not. And that decision involves everyone that takes part in that cause and effect relationship. Okay? Next question. Uh, another question. Um, if the universe or this planet we're living, we want to have peace and calm. We want our lives to be peaceful. They want, we want our lives to have uh, meaning also. And um, the question is, how, how do you get this to everyone that is, you know, people are born in miserable circumstances everywhere across the world. And uh, how do you get rid of it when you have such, you know, spread. Uh, Let me quote uh, one of the best friends of the Venerable Zen Master Sung San. He was the Venerable Mahagosananda, the Supreme Patriarch of Cambodian Buddhism. May him rest in peace. And he said, one peaceful mind creates a peaceful family. One peaceful family creates a peaceful neighborhood. One peaceful neighborhood creates a peaceful city. One peaceful city creates a peaceful country. One peaceful country creates a peaceful continent. One peaceful continent creates a peaceful world. We cannot but begin with ourselves. You cannot project your idea of peace on someone because they take it as an act of war. We have seen it. So begin in yourself. And if you want peace, we have to make peace inside. That radiates outside. Same thing with calmness, prosperity, harmony, social order, etc. So the source is inside of our hearts. If we access that source, we can make a lasting and meaningful difference. If not, we just throw stones around pretending that they are softballs. These are our ideas. Time is of the essence. That's why it's never on sale. That's why we have a certain amount of time, we don't know how much, and then it's gone. So, if you use your priorities very well, then you do the most important thing first, and you have the most important person in your life in the first place. If not, you are wasting your time. So, how does this internal priority become clear? For that, your mind has to be clear. And it's not a time management software that I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is your own 
self. Why you are born? What are you doing? What is your mission in life, if any? And then you know what is most important, who is most important. And do that. And the second comes second, the third comes third. But many times we totally reverse it. We start with the least important. And we finally want to get to the most important, but then you have a sense of running out of time. No, you have all the time that you need, just the priorities are wrong. So if your priorities are right, your sense of importance in terms of time usage, that's also right. Then you feel that you're not wasting your time. In fact, you're capitalizing on time. And then you seem to have more, okay? So, uh, this linear time that we have in our life, in fact, it's a mixture of cycles and linear progress, is the most brutal constant that we have because we cannot reverse it. In space, we have three dimensions. So if you want, you take a circle. I start here, make a circle, this way, this way, and I come back to this point. In time, I cannot do that. That's why there are so many movies about it, ideas that try to break it, even at the level of illusions, that you come back to the same point in time, or you can travel between various points of linear time. It's not possible. As long as the mind is in this body, it's not possible. Okay? So, if you have this as a clear, basic notion, that starts to change your priority. If you lose a moment, you cannot get it back. That's all. So keep your priorities clear. Know what's important, who's important, and know your direction in life. It's great to have zigzags. It's very eventful. Left, right, up, down, this turn, that turn. But when you look back, you said, that's not what I wanted. Maybe I needed to do one or two, but not five, six, seven, or more. And then, you go straight. And that straightness is what cleans up the sense of time. Okay? Good. So I hope all of us will be practicing together, find this clarity, attain our true nature, and save all beings from suffering. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>